Hey friend, welcome back. So in today's show, we're going to focus on the forgotten lipids. These are the remnant low-density lipoproteins and the triglycerides. I know there's a big focus from the conventional medical system about how to lower your so-called bad or LDL cholesterol. Well, it turns out after years and years of dropping LDL cholesterol with statins and other associated medications, people are still dying from heart disease in very large numbers. In fact, as this one study talks about, the title of this paper here is The Role of Remnant Cholesterol Beyond Low-Density Lipoprotein Cholesterol in Diabetes Mellitus. I want to share with you just a quote because it is really telling. These are scientists who are studying this for a living, who are investigating cardiometabolic disease and their associations with diabetes and so forth. They say, however, with the widespread use of statins in recent years, we have shifted our attention to triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, one of the hallmarks of diabetic dyslipidemia that cannot be controlled by statins. So again, they're not essentially saying that statins are useless, but they are saying, hmm, we've been lowering cholesterol by way of statins for years and years. We focused on this. Yet heart disease remains to be the number one cause of mortality in developed countries throughout the entire world. So what exactly are these forgotten lipids? We're going to focus today on the remnant lipoproteins and triglycerides. We're going to talk about the, the sort of Cliff Notes version of this is talk about the importance of non-fasted lipid testing. Throughout most of the day, you were in a non-fasted state. You had a snack. You had a little Kit Kat bar because your coworker said, hey, try this. You went to Starbucks. You had a muffin. You had a little dessert, right? You had a hot dog last night for dinner. When you go to the doctor, most physicians are saying, hey, Sally, before your next round of labs, what we're going to have you do is you're going to fast for 12 to 14 hours. We're going to run your labs and create an artificial utopian blood scenario that really physiologically most people never exist in. And we're going to have clinical inferences made based upon that. That doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? Because for most of the day, most people are in a non-fasted state. And so scientists more and more, and this is something we've been talking about a lot on this podcast, is running non-fasted labs to see what your postprandial or post-meal levels of triglycerides, LDL, ApoB, and also remnant lipoproteins are. So we're going to take a deeper dive into this. Another paper that I would encourage you to check out in the show notes all of these are free on the internet, by the way. It's titled here, I hinted in the introduction, The Forgotten Lipids, Triglycerides, Remnant Cholesterol, and Atherosclerotic Cardiovascular Disease. Uh, really important stuff. Now, as always, friends, before we continue on, we're going to talk about how to measure your labs. I'm going to give you some tools. We're also going to talk about and define what is remnant cholesterol? What are these remnant lipoproteins? And why in the heck haven't you heard about them? But before we do, friends, just want to welcome you back. It's Mike Mutzel, as always. Thank you for being here. Thank you for hitting that like button. If you're enjoying this content, you know what to do. Please share this with a friend directly as a text message. Leave a comment below and hit that like button. I know it sounds like a lot, like three things. Come on, but that goes a long way so that the algorithm will push this into the news feed and help other people like you who are interested in optimizing their health, just like you are. So we're going to talk about a lot of tools towards the end, exercise, diet changes, omega-3 fats, and all that. But I want to give you a little insight into something that can be very effective and pertinent regarding this conversation, supporting metabolic health, and that is berberine hydrochloride. It's honestly, from a nutraceutical standpoint, one of the best solutions to kickstart your fast and to support metabolic health. Of course, we can't make claims. We can't diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases here. We're talking about supporting metabolic health. But if you have not yet used berberine hydrochloride, our sister company, Myoscience, makes an amazing formulation. It's paired with biotin and alpha-lipoic acid that help synergize and help to optimize the function of berberine. So I'll put links below. You can use the coupon code PODCAST to save. That's podcast over at myoscience.com. That's M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com, myoscience.com. Use the code podcast to save on a really cutting edge berberine hydrochloride formulation that can help you support metabolic health and kickstart your fast. Okay, let's continue to dive into this. This is, I think, a topic that doesn't really get a lot of airtime because not too many people know about this and they don't request their remnant cholesterol be tested. They don't request their ApoB be tested when they go to the doctor. Most oftentimes, doctors aren't looking at this unless they're sort of more integrative or functional. And that's a shame. And that's why I want to encourage you to drive the conversation with your doctor and drive evidence-based care and testing so that you can have a better, honest evaluation in terms of your risk for both diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Because... It turns out that this remnant cholesterol is independently associated with diabetes onset, as this paper had talked about and had studied in several thousand Chinese subjects where they looked at 
high LDL cholesterol, low remnant lipoproteins, low LDL cholesterol, high remnant cholesterol, and, and all sorts of it, different iterations there. When they're controlled for all these other variables, the individuals that had actually low LDL cholesterol, but high remnant cholesterol, also remnant lipoproteins, it greater predicted the onset of type two diabetes compared to just having high LDL cholesterol alone. So these remnant lipoproteins, I'll share with you this figure right here. It really tells the story. What they are is essentially, they're a consequence of lipid absorption from the gastrointestinal tract. And so these remnant lipoproteins get formed first by the chylomicrons. So let's just say you go to, I know you never do this, but hypothetically, if you were to go to McDonald's, you were going to have a milkshake, French fries, and a double bacon cheeseburger. Okay, so that's a lot of fat, a lot of sugar all at once, carbohydrates and so forth. So your gastrointestinal tract is going to absorb and assimilate those fats and package them into this bus called the chylomicron bus. That chylomicron bus is going to go into the lymphatic circulation to your liver. And from there, those fats and cholesterol that you just ate will be repackaged into ApoB-containing lipoprotein particles, the first of which is going to be known as VLDL. Then you have the remnant lipoproteins, you have the IDL, and then you eventually have LDL. Okay, and so as you can see from this beautiful image here, the LDL gets is actually the smaller of all the different LDL containing lipoprotein particles. Now that leads people to think, well, if VLDL is bigger and more buoyant than LDL, then it's maybe not that atherogenic, which is not the case. And let me pause and define what does atherogenic really mean? Well, that means the propensity of these low density or very low density lipoprotein particles to cause the pathophysiology of atherosclerosis or the, uh, the foam cell formation and the narrowing and the occlusion in the vessel wall. And so what can happen here is any ApoB containing lipoprotein, the VLDL, the IDL, the LDL, the remnant lipoprotein, all of these different atherogenic lipoproteins have on their cellular surface an apolipoprotein B. And this is really important to know, and this is why I recommend if you don't do any of any other testing besides this going forward, this would be helpful with regards to lipids, testing your ApoB to ApoA1 ratio. And this is important because again, all of these atherogenic particles have on their cell surface apolipoprotein B, also known as ApoB. Your HDL in contrast have the ApoA1 protein on the extracellular surface. And think of this like a license plate. You see buses and cars on the road. You have two different license plates. You have either ApoB or ApoA1. If you have an, a really high amount of, of ApoB license plate on the road and not enough ApoA1 license plates on the road, there's going to be an imbalance in the lipid exchange, and that's going to be problematic. That is linked, as this paper has found, with the onset of diabetes, with the onset of heart disease, with the onset of fatty liver disease, and much more because there's an imbalance in lipid transport. So if you don't spend any additional money on advanced lipoprotein particle testing or do something like a Berkeley or Boston Heart Lab or Cleveland Heart Lab test, just ask your doctor, hey doc, I know we're not doing boutique labs here, but can you at least run my ApoB to A1 ratio? This costs $12. $12, like literally, most insurance companies should have no problem paying for this. And this is going to give you a better insight. Now, furthermore, if you want to go an extra, the extra mile, you can also request your VLDL be tested along with the LDL and, and even better would be a remnant lipoprotein assessment as well. Um, so that's just, that was a side tangent, but let's get back to what's going on here. So what we're talking about with these remnant lipoproteins and, and remnant cholesterol is not the LDL, it's more the IDL and the VLDL. And these are both enriched in triglycerides and cholesterol. And so these are actually equally atherogenic, but they also drive inflammatory processes within the body. And I think that's an important aspect that a lot of people don't really recognize with regards to the mechanism as to how statins actually work. And I think a big part, and I know it's controversial to even mention this in a platform like this, some of the positive effects of statins could be that they're anti-inflammatory. And because these lipoproteins, particularly the VLDL and the remnant lipoproteins, uh, again, these are often not talked about or discussed in, in patient care. Mostly the focus is on LDL cholesterol. I think because statins have inherent anti-inflammatory properties, that, that could be some of the independent associations with the positive effects that are linked with statin use. And so 
it's just important to understand that there are some positives here with statin use, and I'm not suggesting that you go on and get a statin, but part of these associations could be linked with the anti-inflammatory properties because high amounts of the VLDL, the remnant, the, the IDL, that is linked with uh, driving inflammatory processes, uh, driving atherosclerosis, and increasing insulin resistance, all of which are bad, okay? So there's four reasons why the remnants are bad. So they're involved in driving inflammatory processes, as we've talked about. They're also involved in um, driving metabolic disease because they increase the so-called ectopic lipid deposition. Now, we know that as diabetes progresses, part of how diabetes progresses is because the pancreas gets infiltrated with fat. And that fat infiltration in the pancreas, remember the pancreas is the organ that releases both insulin and glucagon, when fat is infiltrated within that organ, it causes the cells to release less insulin. It augments glucagon and so forth secretion. So fat infiltration in the muscle, in the heart, in the liver, uh, in, in the pancreas is bad. You do not want ectopic lipid deposition. So that's part of the consequence here uh, linked with these, these different remnant lipoproteins. Also, they're very atherogenic and they also induce endothelial dysfunction. So we've talked about this before. The endothelium, this is the organ of your cardiovascular system. This is the functional unit that needs to be intact. Erectile dysfunction is linked with endothelial dysfunction. So it's important to understand that the endothelium can become attacked and augmented with these remnant lipoproteins. Last, but certainly not least, is the induction of clotting cascades. Now, this is something that was new to me, but I think is really important. So as the scientists go on to say, in addition to their pro-inflammatory effects, these triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, the remnant cholesterol, lead to the activation of coagulation cascades through assembly of the prothrombase complex and upregulation of the expression of all sorts of PA1, this is the uh, plasminogen activator inhibitor gene, all sorts of complex factors involved in promoting clotting. Now, we've heard all about clotting over the past several years. We know that clotting is a, is a risk factor linked with just inherent infection with COVID-19. So this is, again, important with regards to risk stratification for who could be more susceptible to severe COVID-19. And it, it could be individuals who have underlying metabolic disease. They are, they're more sedentary. They're not physically active, eating more processed foods and things like that. So it turns out that remnant lipoproteins induce clotting cascades in, a, in addition to driving inflammation. Most importantly here is how these remnant triglyceride-rich lipoproteins cause atherosclerosis and are involved in their, their atherogenic formation. So I guess this is more of a review, but I think it's important that you understand this because some people aren't aware uh, about how these ApoB-containing lipoproteins, again, the VLDL, the remnants, IDL, and LDL, cause atherosclerosis. So the scientists want to say, Triglyceride-rich lipoproteins can readily penetrate the arterial wall and are susceptible to retention by connective tissue matrix through the interaction of their positively charged residues on the exterior surface of their ApoB-containing lipoprotein. And so what, what happens is once these lipoproteins, these are like little golf balls, okay? Think about your, a tennis net and you have a little golf ball, okay? That little golf ball could be your, some vessels in your body. What happens is these lipoproteins, these are these buses with the ApoB license plate, they're floating around and they go through that tennis net, which is your vessels, uh, the, the, the endothelial tissue. And once they get in, inside there, they, they become trapped in the subendothelial space, and they become modified or oxidized, and they get uh, taken up by these scavenger receptors and these macrophages, and these macrophages get so fat, they get stuck in there. And so what happens is that is the sort of really oversimplified analogy uh, as, as to how plaque is formed. And the, if this occurs in the coronary arteries, over time, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, you start to get coronary artery occlusion, which means the artery is narrowing. And then eventually it might close and you get necrosis, you get tissue death, you have a myocardial infarction, right? Uh, again, very oversimplifying, but essentially that's what can happen. And these remnant triglyceride-rich lipoproteins are more atherogenic than LDL cholesterol. And again, as this paper talked about, we're not, from a clinical perspective, most doctors are not focusing 
on this. They're focused on just the LDL cholesterol, not the remnant lipoproteins. We're looking at fasted lipid levels, not postprandial or postmeal lipid levels, which is what we need to be focusing on to really get a true assessment of people's metabolic health and to then you know, custom tailor treatment to support the reduction in the remnant cholesterol in these very atherogenic, very pro-inflammatory inducers of poor metabolic health and clotting, right? These remnant lipoproteins. We got to focus on that. Uh, as James DiNicolantonio has talked about before and many others, the oil composition, the, 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 the types of fats that you're eating in your diet become incorporated into these lipoprotein particles and can render them more oxidizable. So that process that I mentioned where these remnant lipoproteins are floating around, they get inside the tennis net, then they get engulfed by the macrophage, they get oxidized and so on. Well, if you're eating a lot of highly oxidizable, say, canola, cottonseed oil, uh, refined oils in your diet from soy and so forth, fried foods, well, guess what can happen? That can just increase the propensity of these lipoproteins to become modified, oxidized, and to increase the narrowing and the so-called occlusion of the vessels that can ultimately lead to a cardio or a cerebrovascular event like a stroke, which is not good, okay? So we need to understand that. Okay, let's just quickly review the testing because I kind of went through it sort of quick, and then we'll talk about the solutions, what to do from an exercise, fasting, nutraceutical, you know, dietary standpoint. But first, with regards to testing. Most of you should have fasted lipid levels at this point. You have your fasted LDL cholesterol. You're going to download our blood work cheat sheet that will be available in the, the links below. Everything that we're talking about on page one, request that, Get, print that out, give it to your doctor. You can cut off the high intensity health header if you want. Just give it to the doctor and say, hey, hey doc, I haven't done labs in a year or so. I want to make sure that everything is functioning properly in my body, get ahead of any diseases that could be potentially brewing as a result of my exercise or nutrition lifestyle habits. And you're going to request this. On that is the APOB to A1 ratio, that $12 test. You're also going to look at your VLDL, LDL, and HDL. If you want to spend three or 400 bucks and do a boutique advanced lipoprotein particle assessment, that's on you. Totally fine if you do that. But once you have your fasted labs, it's also good to have non-fasted lipid levels. You want to see what your triglycerides and your ApoB particles and your VLDL and LDL cholesterol are doing in the non-fasted state. So you might have a normal meal. For me, it's like three to four eggs, maybe sometimes six eggs. I might have some avocado, maybe some ground beef, some olive, some kimchi. That would be a normal meal. I would like to see in yourself and myself, what does my triglycerides look like in the post-meal window? And so we've talked about this lipid load test. You can Google it. You can learn more about it. If your blood triglycerides are, are more than 220 nanograms per ml, that is going to be indicative of the fact that you have poor handling of fats in the post-meal window. You have this process going on potentially that we've been talking about here, this atherogenic dyslipidemia, this, this poor handling that, again, is going to increase probability of clots. It's going, to inc it's going to drive heart disease. It's going to drive inflammation. It's going to drive metabolic disease, all of which are not good. So what do you do? Let's talk about that, okay? Number one, you got to lose weight, okay, especially around the abdomen. Visceral adiposity, belly fat is linked with poor levels of both triglycerides and these remnant lipoproteins. Okay, so just a, a small amount of weight loss, like 5% of your overall body weight, can actually uh, drop triglyceride levels that are, triglycerides, by the way, are strongly correlated independently with remnant cholesterol and these, these triglyceride-rich lipoproteins. So a reduction in, in your triglycerides will correlate um, with, with these remnants and so forth. Dietary modification, so eating a lower carb diet, uh, is linked with a 15 to 20% reduction in triglycerides. I've seen this often with clients where they come into me, their fasting triglycerides are two to 300. They're, you know, metabolic mess, they have belly fat and stuff. We do a few different things with regards to exercise and compressing their feeding window, cutting out the carbs, getting them walking more. And boom, triglycerides drop like a rock. It's really impressive. Um, to that effect, the studies have actually shown a greater than 20% reduction in triglycerides by just incorporating regular exercise, both resistance training and also aerobic exercise. Okay, so walking after meals is a phenomenal way to not only drop your post meal glucose, but to improve the handling of the dietary fats that you've eaten. Okay, pharmacology. Well, 
I know it's unpopular to talk about statins, but there is data showing that statins do lower triglycerides 20 to 30%. The downside of statins is they also induce insulin resistance. So you're sort of robbing Peter to pay Paul a little bit in the sense that we know that insulin resistance can increase triglyceride levels. Uh, and so, uh, you know, obviously if you can do all this with diet and lifestyle, you probably don't need to go on a statin, okay? That's just my personal opinion, but always check with your doctor. Uh, this is not medical advice. Uh, now, one of the things that actually is under-recognized but is so effective for reducing triglycerides is omega-3 fats. And I'll just say clinically, I used to work with Gerard Guillory in Colorado. He's seen thousands of patients, put thousands of patients on two to three grams of omega-3 fats in the form of fish oil per day and found just dramatic reductions in triglycerides. Okay, now, of course, we have to exercise. We have to eat better. We can't be going to McDonald's for lunch and things like that. But when you start to increase the quantity of high-quality uh, third-party tested omega-3s, you can, studies actually show, and this is clinically, we see this a lot, a reduction in triglycerides. Now, you might say, well, how is it doing this? How is taking a fat, albeit small amounts of a long-chain omega-3 fat that contains EPA and DHA, how is that linked with a reduction in triglycerides? It's due to the signaling that it, that is occurring and possibly reducing the probability of oxidizing some of these long chain fats within the lipoproteins as well. Um, so there's some really interesting physiology that's going on with regards to the PPAR alpha and other uh, peroxisomes that are activated when you take these omega-3s. And so, again, they may not be for everything, for everyone, for every condition, but we do offer a test over at Myoscience, and this is the omega-3 index. You can save on that using the coupon code that I'll link below. The omega-3 index helps to quantify how much omega-3s are in uh, in your body, basically the long-term storage. And so you, you want to aim for somewhere around 8%. I was a little disappointed, you know, when I stopped my omega-3 supplements. I feel like I eat a a pretty well-rounded diet and, and thought that I might be getting a little bit more omega-3 fats from grass-fed beef and, you know, backyard chicken eggs and things like that. But my omega-3 index was only 5.7. So I know a lot of people are on the fence about omega-3. Should you take them? Should you not? Do you need them? I think it's best to quantify, right? Just test, don't guess. For $47, you can figure this out. Hop on over to Myoscience, check out the omega-3 index, and that's something that you can consider. Again, the dosing, you don't have to do this forever. This can be 900 milligrams to, to you know 3,000 or three grams of fish oil. Um, but what, what we're striving for is a triglyceride level around 60 to 70. Okay, that's that's important to understand. Uh, and then a postprandial triglyceride level, uh, I like to aim, you know, when I'm working with people, less than 180, okay? Uh, and so we need, to, we need to understand that, yeah, those are some of the targets that, that we're looking here for. Again, if you're doing post, uh, you know, post-prandial tests versus uh, you know, fasted and so forth. But the combination here, it's not just one thing. We're not just giving people just omega-3s. You have to exercise. Combination of both resistance training and also aerobic training. We're talking about eating a lower-carb diet. We're talking about walking after meals. We're talking about going to bed earlier, optimizing circadian rhythm health. These are all things, focusing on protein, prioritizing protein. All these can be very helpful. And so hopefully you got some value here. I know some of this, it's new information for some of you, talking about ApoB to A1 ratios, remnant lipoproteins and all this. But it's important to really understand that even mainstream scientific investigators are now recognizing that we spent the better part of 20 years focusing on reducing LDL cholesterol, yet heart disease remains to be the number one cause of mortality. And there's independent associations with these remnant lipoprotein particles and their links with increased risk for both diabetes and heart disease. It's really important. We can't disentangle metabolic disease from cardiovascular events. Uh, there's a strong co-occurrence here. So poor metabolic health is part of the conversation and high, LD, high, sorry, high triglycerides and high remnant cholesterol increases your odds of developing metabolic disease. And this is more important for women. In fact, this association between the high triglycerides and high remnants is a better predictor of future development of metabolic disease in women compared to men. So this is really important to understand this, really important to get an, an honest evaluation, staying up on your blood work once a year, every 18 months, checking fasted and non-fasted labs periodically to see how you're handling the meals that you habitually eat in the post-meal window. See what happens to your triglycerides and your ApoB and, and so forth. So 
Hopefully you got some value out of this. I encourage you to read some of the papers that we linked here in the show notes and discussed today. Uh, hopefully these images were helpful in helping you to better understand what's going on beyond LDL cholesterol with a little bit of a deeper dive into these forgotten lipids. That's it for today, friends, but thank you for sharing this video. Thank you for commenting. Thank you for hitting the like button, and we'll catch you in a future one down the road. Bye now.